Jesus is standing on that Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah. These things are happening. And in a New Testament narrative, we're no longer in the old where God was looking for a mediator, someone he could talk to that would speak his language. You know that, right? He was speaking his language. In the Old Testament, when God appeared to people, it was different than the new. And many people think the only difference between the Old and the New Testament is a blank page in their Bible. There's this guy named Jesus who showed up and changed it all. So in the Old Testament, when God showed up to the party, it was thunderbolts and lightning. Why? There was no mediator. There was no Jesus. There was nothing. God showed up, and it was direct holiness touching direct fallen sin. So when God showed up on Mount Sinai, the top of the mountain was scorched and burning. And it was him saying, I'm going to come be with my people. And they were screaming in terror. <laughs> And God looked at their sin unshielded, and he's like, Moses, don't let any of them come near me. I'll kill every one of them. You filthy slobs. He said, if even as much as an animal touches the mountain, it has to be stoned to death. You realize when the law changed, you know, even when they had the law where um, there was no law beforehand, right? And then suddenly in the camp, he, God instilled law. He instilled commandments. And suddenly somebody broke the law. You know what the first law ever broken was? A man picked up sticks on the Sabbath. Before the law came, it was like, well, whatever. There's no accountability. God gives the law. A man picks up sticks on the Sabbath, and they said, what should we do with this lawbreaker? And the word of the Lord came forward and said, show him no mercy, take him outside of town, and stone him. I like Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is better. People are like, you got to keep that law. Well, which ones? Well, there's a ceremonial, and then there's the, you know, the, you know, just the, the rest of the laws. And No, there's all the laws. And James says, you break one, you pick up sticks on the Sabbath. You're guilty of everything. You're guilty. Thank God for Jesus. But God was looking for a mediator the whole time, and he had no Jesus. He had nobody that paid all the sin. It was such a supernatural violation of God's holiness. We think, we think well, if God wanted to not make hell, he wouldn't have. And God doesn't want to send people there, but ah, he just gets a little angry sometimes and hangs them over, and he's like, yeah, I choose you. You're dying. Okay, well, yeah, well, I'll keep you. You're nice. God's not like that. He's not like that. People are like, why would a loving God do this? I want to know why a loving God put up with any of it. God's holiness was so extreme, so heightened, that when he was violated by Lucifer and his band of rebellious celestial punks, when they violated his holiness, there was no punishment. Listen to me. God is so extreme. His holiness is so off the chain so perfect, so pure, that when he was violated, there was no punishment to resolve that. Because he's number one. He's the best. There's no equal to him. Nobody could step up and say, I will pay that violation. So hell was formed. And hell will never be quenched until the day comes that it's cast into the lake of fire. And even then, that's not enough. Hell is not enough in all its fury, torture, and endless existence to pay for the holiness that was violated in God. That's why hell will never stop burning. It's, it doesn't have enough rage. It doesn't have enough justice, not enough punishment to equal that. So God looked at all that and said, well, nobody can fix this. So Jesus, I guess it's us. I got to pay for what they did if I want them in my life. And Jesus did it. Now, here we are, and God needed a mediator back in the Old Testament. Mediators that stepped up and got even a glimpse of it started to alter things. Moses could alter things because he knew God. You begin to see, you begin to see all these things in the Old Testament era where, where the, the Lord God Almighty is wanting to do so many things with a nation, and people just kept screwing up. Even David. David was... He was captain screw-up. <clears throat> he had, like, a double doctorate in stupid. But David had one thing going for him. He understood the Lord. 
And God has this thing, and here's the secret. The secret is God doesn't tell you. He wants to see if you will discover it. Do you remember the parable of the talents? The man hid the one, the guy had five, then there's ten. The one who hid the one, when the master came back, what did he say to him? He said, I knew you to be a hard man. I knew you were this way. I know you this way. This is how I know you. And the Lord said to him, you knew me to be a hard man? Okay, take what he has and give it to the one with ten. Be it to you as you believe. So here we see in the Old Testament, God's looking for a mediator. He's looking for someone that will feel like him. Do you remember the story of old Phineas? Old Phineas, right? When the people of God decided it was okay to marry foreign women and be lewd and crude with them, and right in front of the tent of meeting, one guy shows up, and uh, they decide that they're going to act out their perversion in front of the gang. And Phineas, he got so upset, it says he shook with indignation. He ran to where they were acting out their perversion, and put a spear through both of them. He stuck it, pinned it down. And he said in that moment that the righteousness of God, his zeal, consumed him. And the Lord said about him, he understood my, he was zealous for me, therefore I will make a priesthood out of him. And that's when the Levites came back. That's when the Levites got instituted because Phinehas acted like God. And God saw that. Someone feels the way I feel about this, and they took action. Now, in the New Testament, we don't do that. (laughs) Lord, you want me to just take a javelin and deal with that? Hallelujah. Some pastors are probably like, I vote yes. (laughs) But that's not the heart of God at all. God's always been loving. He's always been merciful. He's always been all these things. But pure holiness can't deal with pure sin. That's why God needed a mediator. Because pure holiness stepping into the natural to us without a mediator like Jesus who fulfills all the laws looks like thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening. That's why in the Old Testament it was so demonstrative when God would show up. It would be burning and and brimstone. And when God spoke, the people begged Moses, "Don't, don't let God say another thing. Please, can he not talk anymore? No more talking. Oh, my God, it's scary. That's what they were saying. And the Lord's like, what in the name of me is your problem? Too much? Everybody okay? (laughs) But you recognize something about this. The Lord God Almighty, he loved you from the beginning. He loved you when he made this place, and he fought for you for thousands of years until the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, until King Jesus came into play. And now, again, in the New Testament, we're not mediators like Moses was in the Old Testament or David or prophets that he needed to speak directly from him to the people. And if you get anything off, I'll kill you. That was Old Testament. New Testament, my spirit is upon my sons and daughters. All men, all the body of Christ has a touch of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might not be baptized in the Spirit, but you've got the Holy Ghost inside you. In other words, you're regenerated. John 20, verse 22, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He wasn't talking about the baptism. He was talking about the regeneration. You're not dead inside anymore. In the Old Testament, they were dead. They were separated from God. Jesus breathed into them, and they became saved people. Now the things they were trying to keep through willpower in the Old Testament was printed on their hearts in the New Testament. And Jesus paid it all. If you're in him and his words abide in you, it's your enchilada. So in this picture, in the New Testament era, God is also looking for a form of action with the mediator, his son, through the body of Christ. Listen, we are becoming the bride. We're not the bride today. We're becoming the bride. Absolutely. You see Revelation 21, it says, Come, I will show you the wife of the Lamb, the bride, coming down from heaven. It's the new Jerusalem. Now, it's either a city or it's us in the city, but that's when we see the bride. The consummation is happening. During this time, we're the body of Christ. His hands, his feet, doing the stuff. And so when you're looking at this and you recognize, my goodness, God wants us to do things, and the Lord is saying to his church, you've had a lot of teaching. You've had generations of revivals, circumstances going on. What do you want to do? You want to phone it in? Or do you want to win one more round? 
And you say, well, what do, what do you mean by that? What are you talking about? Well, the Bible's really clear. You recognize things in the Old Testament, they could alter circumstances. I'm not saying all, anything and everything can be altered, but there are moments you can alter things. I'm bringing this to us because I believe what's coming next is going to require the church to take action to alter the narrative because as he is, 1 John 4, 17 says, so are we in this world. In other words, we are the body of Christ. So we say God's in control. He's got this. Not without our cooperation, he doesn't. You say, how can you say that? Because he left us here. He gave us the Holy Spirit to finish the work on earth, or he'd have just taken us out of here. If he's just in control and his sovereign plan that none of us know about, you never know what God's going to do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. If only he'd given us a map and a, 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 just a manual to understand this life. If only there was some written document that we could read and really begin to know what he wanted, his will on earth as it is in heaven. What would God ever have us do? Are you out of your mind? People are like, I don't know if I can make it, brother. Hold up now. You don't know if you can make it. You got praise and worship that's anointed. You come into places, you get, you get filled with the Spirit. You could speak in tongues. You got wonderful leaders you can hang out with. You could be in a fellowship of believers. You can get filled up. You got the written Word of God to read, and you don't know if you can make it. And people are like, that's offensive. If that offends you, you need to be offended. Take it in deep. I'm offended. I'm so offended. If you're offended, you are pre-offended. I'm just helping you manifest it. <laughs> I'm so offended. Man. <laughs> Praise God. If you're offended, I don't care. If you're hurt and you need help with the church, we care very much. And you come to the leadership, you come to the body where you get embraced and nurtured and you walk through your hurt, but you're not supposed to stay there. But you are to be, you are to be loved and you are to be healed. And we are all about that. But if you're offended, like, I don't agree with that. It's like, that's why your life's not effective. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> Praise God. It ran in my family till it ran into me. So in the New Testament, mediators... We're the body of Christ. As he is, so are we in this world. We have this idea that Jesus is so extreme and amazing, which he is. He's beyond words. There's nothing like Jesus. Nobody, no thing, nothing. The spirit without measure. But I got to tell you guys, the body of Christ has the same Holy Ghost he had. The same Holy Ghost. You don't have a little bit and another person get more. It is to the level of your moving you and the commitment you have and the word of God in you that lines you up with what you already have. God poured his spirit out upon all flesh. Sons and daughters prophesy. That's now. That's not coming. That's now. That happened in Acts chapter 2. It's there for the taking. And the body of Christ many times says, well, God's in control. If he wants me to do it, I'll have it. No, you have to cooperate. You know, you don't need to tarry and beg and plead to speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues is easy. It's your peanut brain that stops you. It's your little brain. It's that little woulda, coulda, shoulda brain. This sounds stupid. Is it just me? You have to move your mouth. Yes, it's you. The Lord's not going to come on you like he's taking over your life like power steering. It's not going to be like that. Reminds me of the person that's at Thanksgiving. You ever have some of those weird intercessors around you? And you bring them over because you feel bad for them at Thanksgiving or something, you're hanging out. And they're like, so and so, would you pray? And they're like, yes, I will. And they're like, ah! You ever been around that? Yeah. And then everybody's like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> those wacky Christians. <laughs> Take them wherever you go. You don't know what they're going to do. Wind them up and let them go. <laughs> Is this too much? Everybody all right? <laughs> Praise God. I'd keep going anyway, but I just figured I'd ask you. Here's the bottom line. The Lord wants 
fire-baptized, clear-eyed, clear-minded, disciplined believers that are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, walking in the Word of God, their skills, their gifts are sharpened and honed, and they know who they are. They're not walking around blind. They're not walking around saying, who am I? Who's my father? I don't know who I am. They're not walking around like that. And then I believe we can alter things. How many of you know the devil? The devil, he couldn't beat the early church. So he did the next best thing. He joined it. And he denominated the nation. We dunk. We sprinkle. We speak in tongues. We don't speak in tongues. That foosball's a devil. We don't do any of that stuff, right? We don't do any of that stuff. We, 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 we don't do that stuff. You know what? We're, we don't. We're, we're, um, we're a non-denominational denomination. Thank you. Some churches, you know, they're... They're like, you know, we just believe in freedom here, but they're really deacon-possessed. You got a deacon? Nobody? Deacon-possessed churches. God, you keep them humble. We'll keep them poor. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he denominized the nation. And we got to get back to where we have a unification because if things are too small, men fight, right? We know that. If things are too small, men fight. They fight, they squabble, they war against one another. But if it's big enough, like we're in right now at the end of this time here with uh, uh, where we could end up with a Jezebel in the office, if it's big enough, men will unite. And if they begin to unite around the cross and we all come together, we can actually start taking over. We can start doing what we're called to do. So here's what we recognize. In the New Testament, we can alter time too. We can alter time. Let me get a running start at this. John chapter 3. I want you to see this. John chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. Jesus answered in John chapter 3, verse 5, right? He said, Jesus answered, talking to Nicodemus. Nick at night came to see Jesus. <laughs> Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. What are we talking about? Jesus said, unless you're born of water first, you cannot be born again. You've got to be born of water first, then spirit, then you can enter the kingdom of God. What are we talking about? You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 46, it says that the spirit is not first, but the natural. The spirit is not first, but the natural. When it says in John chapter 3, you must be first born of water, it's talking about when a woman's water breaks and a baby comes forth and the baby turns into a living citizen, which was living all along in Jesus' name. I remember my wife, Heather, she's the best. We're in a meeting. This is probably 23, 24 years ago. We're in a meeting about like this. I'm leading worship, I'm preaching, I'm doing all these things. We're in the back, and she's pregnant with our daughter, Allison. And all of a sudden, her sister, Holly, who works for us today, said, um, Heather's water just broke. I was like, really? I leaned over to Heather, and I said, do you think you could wait 15 minutes? <laughs> I need just a little more time to sing and do some, some stuff. And her sister leaned over, and she said, no. <laughs> Holly looked at me like, I'm going to you right here. That was during the time I began to learn things about how life is. So I rushed Heather in. She had the delivery. We had an awesome baby. But here's the thing. When waters break, babies come forth. And babies are living human beings that stand up. And now they have the right to step into the spirit and have God breathe that life into them, John 20, 22, And they get born again and enter the kingdom, the spirit. Unless you are born of water, born as a human being, and then you are born of spirit, Jesus saves you. Those two combo, that combo is how you enter the kingdom of heaven. So you got to be a physical being. So as a physical being, in the Old Testament, they had authority, and even God had to show up in an earth suit to come talk to people civilly without burning the mountain. 
He would come talk to them civilly. That's how he met with Abraham. He had to show up in the flesh, almost an avatar-type setting. I don't know how it all works, but the Lord had to temporarily do that so he might speak with Abraham. In the New Testament, God doesn't do that anymore because there was one born of a virgin who showed up with a permanent earth suit, walked into the natural, fully God, fully man. And when he first showed up in the demons saw him, and they went, no. And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> they said, it's not fair. Don't torture us before our time. And he's like, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> shut your foul mouth. And he said, how you like me now? You like the new suit? I'm the second Adam, baby. I'm the last Adam. And I'm here to take it back. So Jesus came in the flesh, condemned sin in the earth suit. And he was the prototype for what you and I are. As he is, so are we in this world. And when we come into this world, if we get in cooperation with what he's called us to do individually, corporately, where we belong in the body, we can move the needle. I'm standing here in front of the Washington Memorial, and here's something I want to say to everybody. This nation was founded on godly principles. We have a lot of heritage that is trying to be ripped away from us right now, but I got great news. I've got hope for you. Jesus is Lord and the Ecclesia, the church, the called out ones are here. And we're able to stand against some of the nefarious plans of evil right in the middle of this present evil age. Listen to me, Jesus wants you to rise and shine in the middle of this darkness. I'm here, I'm praying. I'm realizing that even here where George Washington's monument is, what happened in the very beginning of our nation is something that is unprecedented in modern history. And I'm telling you, there's another valley of decision. An unprecedented moment in modern history is coming right before us, and we have the opportunity to seize the day. And what I see happening is not only are we coming into the time where we pick our leaders, but there's a great season coming after that, a season rising up after that, where we can see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and see our children's children have a future that's worth living. And here's what I believe is going to happen. I believe as the righteous rise and we pray, regardless of who wins or what the outcome is, the Lord is going to be glorified through the ecclesia. Now it's my heart and my desire that we see the goodness of the Lord manifest even in the right people getting into the highest office of the land. I'm believing that'll happen. But even if it doesn't, the ecclesia is still here and righteousness will happen. But here's what you need to do. You need to ensure that righteousness is advanced. And that means you gotta go and you gotta make a choice. You gotta vote, you gotta stand, you gotta see the Lord work through you. You're a free moral agent, and here's what we've gotta do. We gotta pray, we gotta intercede, but as you go out and you begin to vote, you begin to take authority over what's going on physically around you by casting your choice, here's what will take place. Jesus will be glorified, the kingdom of God will advance, and there's gonna be another day, another round coming. And I gotta tell you, God wants to work through you. First John 4, 17 says, as he is, so are we in this world. And that means we take his presence wherever we go. So I'm standing here, right here in the nation's capital, in front of the Washington Monument, and I'm interceding, and I'm praying. Please join me in that. Praying for our nation. And I'm praying right now. In Jesus' name, I ask you, Lord, for the goodness of the Lord to manifest in the land of the living, where righteousness begins to prevail in this land. This nation was founded for a purpose. It was founded to glorify God, <laughs> one nation under God, that we can see another round and another time of victory. I believe we can truly change the outcome of where the evil plans of wickedness are trying to take us. I believe we can see righteousness prevail and I believe we can see one more round for our children's children. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, please. If you pray, if you show up, I believe we can change the outcome of what the enemy means for evil. God is with you. So Lord, right now I lift up the Washington Monument 
in faith, in favor, in the name of Jesus, that righteousness would be exalted in this nation. I plead the blood of Jesus over this land. I plead the blood of Jesus over our monuments, over the foundation of our forefathers. And I ask again, God, for one more round, one more opportunity to see righteousness prevail in this land. In Jesus' name, I just come into agreement with everybody watching that we will see righteousness have another day. I bless you. Remember, no matter what happens, you're here and Jesus is with you. And you don't have to fear what's coming next because the goodness of God is going to make a way for you and your children's children. Let's stand in agreement. Let's take this right down to the one yard line and let's win by faith. I believe God is going to have a righteous outcome, but we need your faith. We need to agree and come into agreement in prayer to see this thing come through. Now, let me say one more thing. Partners, I want to thank you for standing with us and sending us on locations like this to intercede, to pray, to be on divine assignment, to minister to pivotal people and leaders. I'm telling you, the goodness of the Lord will manifest in the land of the living. The goodness of the Lord will manifest in a way that will bring righteousness to your children's children. I have hope, I have encouragement, and I believe it's gonna be a good outcome regardless of what man says. Let's keep standing, let's keep believing, let's keep discerning because the Lord's gonna make a way where there has been no way. I bless you and thank you for standing with us. Jesus is Lord in Washington, D.C. Well, I'm standing here outside our World Broadcast Center. Now, with the World Broadcast Center, we have a little bit extra land that's on it. Not much, but just enough that if we wanted to add on, we could. I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment, but right now I wanna thank so many of you who've participated in making this building what it is. Now, we're getting to the point, we're going to take a major lunge forward by faith and by really good planning. And that has to do with television and advanced media. Now we're already taking dramatic steps. One very exciting thing that's happening is the Sid Roth Network has reached out to us and they're having us air our live broadcasts every day simultaneously with their television network. A simpler way of saying it is, when we go live in the morning, they will air that live on their TV network. And I gotta tell you, it is amazing what the Lord's doing to open doors for us and our partners to reach more and more viewers and people all around the world. But to really accomplish this, we've got to develop a call center, a call center that's going to really help you and your family. We want to minister to you more. We want to be able to be present for you in a greater capacity. The way we want to move forward is with a new call center. And I'm talking high touch that beats high tech every time. What does that mean? It means when you call in that you get somebody. We're here for you in real time during our live broadcast. And we have a place that will reach out and minister to you, our partners. And we just want to be here for you. If you're a viewer, a partner, we want to be available. And we have to make a place or more room for the production of our materials, meaning shipping out books to you and teachings and so much more that we are just getting into right now. And that means we have to finish this building. And to do that, we need your help. We need your help through your donations, your time, anything that you can do. By time, I mean prayer, in any way that you can spend your efforts through prayer and faith with us, we so appreciate it. But more than anything else, we're looking for partners that will help us finish this building. And if you have any interest in really sewing into this today and standing with us over the World Broadcast Center, the total cost that we have left to knock this out, to get done with phase one, we're calling it phase one because it's the studios, the building payment to pay it off in full, and in addition to that, to remodel everything inside is 1.2 million. And we're looking to knock that out this year. We need your help. We wanna see this advance and we're thrilled about it. And I wanna say a huge thank you to all of you 
who've helped with this so far. You've sown, you've stood with us, but we have a little bit more to go. And I'd encourage you to do so today by going to josephz.com and helping us finish up this project so we can move forward and better serve you and the body of Christ. We're so grateful. Remember, it's a million for a billion. And here we are at the World Broadcast Center, and I believe that we together can get this done very quickly. I love you, I bless you, and thank you for your support. I wanna tell you about an amazing opportunity that has just been presented to us. We've had a supernatural door of opportunity open for us. Only God could do what is happening for this ministry right now. And it is involving television, network television, satellite television, going all over the world. Now, there's a lot in store for this, but let me explain. This is a word God's given us to reach a billion people for the gospel. And I feel an urgency for this coming year to advance and go forward because of the uniqueness of what God has spoken in this ministry and through this ministry in media. And here's what we have to do. To accomplish this, we not only have to buy the airtime, but we have to build out a call center and finish this building. And we are in the middle of it right now, but the timeline has just been sped up to fall time so we can be ready for the first of the year when we're gonna begin to launch out in television in a monumental way. Now we've had an opportunity that is both fiscally responsible and financially amazing the way God has done this for us. And we have to take opportunity right now with it because it won't last long. So here's what I'm asking you. Would you consider supporting us helping us build out the call center, helping us finish off this building, and helping us with the budget of airtime. And it is gonna be a monumental thing, and the Lord has given us favor, and I can't wait to tell you more and more about it. But if you would consider partnering today over this, I know we can hit this target, I know we can walk through the door, and I know we can raise up a million to go win a billion. And I'm telling you, this is a God moment. It's a now word. And I'm asking you if you consider partnering with us over it. Maybe you want to become a partner, or if you are a partner, maybe you'd consider increasing your partnership today or giving a one-time offering. This is an amazing open door for this ministry and this broadcast. Everything we've prayed about, everything the Lord has told us to do is now coming to this monumental moment. Next year, we're going to reach the masses like never before, but we need your help. Please consider going to josephz.com right now and supporting this amazing open door. Thank you so very much. Well, we wanna invite you to this year's annual conference. You know, we had a great time last year. We did such a great conference together last year. Right? We had a blast. Oh, it was awesome. Power of God, prophecy, teaching, apostles, and prophets. It was awesome. Well, people were touched and we got a lot of inquiries. We did. Will you do this again? Yes. So we decided we're going to do this annual conference yes. again. Yes, and I'm quite excited about this one and we want you to join us. It's going to be really powerful when we're hands on people. Oh, we are. It's going to be intense ministry and we want you to do everything you can to get there. We hope to see you there because we know God's going to touch you. It's a now word and with the days we're facing, you're going to need this empowerment and you're going to have hope and faith to go forward. We hope that you'll join us. And what's the name of the conference? Voice of God. Voice of God. That's what we need. God is always speaking. He's looking for whoever has ears to hear. So if you have ears to hear, you need to come join us. We hope to see you there. In today's world, there's a lot of noise and sensationalism by many claiming to hear the voice of God. They cite their predictions and their own experiences. Now, some are legitimate and some are not, but how do we know the difference? In some ways, prophecies become a mystified topic. Yet as global chaos is obviously increasing, it is imperative that we must hear and know the voice of God and true prophecy. I'm Joseph Z, and I just wrote this book, Demystifying the Prophetic. Now, it's taken me my whole life of walking through the Word of God and my own encounters and experiences to bring this to a place where we land at biblical truth and sound doctrine, yet absolutely celebrating the precious gift of prophecy. In this book, I deal with everything from trances and dreams, visions, 
deja vu even. Different types of prophets, we talk about it. We even cover the topic of false prophets. How do you determine who's true and who's false? We talk about discerning the times, navigating strange encounters. People talk about angels appearing to them, entities appearing to them, they hear voices. All of these unique things we begin to deal with at a very powerful level with this book. I bring you straight to the written word of God, and I want to say to you, isn't it time we understand the purpose of prophecy? After all, it is the spirit of prophecy that gives testimony to Jesus. It's time for results in your life. It's time for you to begin demystifying the prophetic. This book will help you. I promise you need this book. It'll break you out of containment. It'll bring you into a place of clarity and it will open up the understanding of the voice of God and prophecy functioning in your life by the written word of God. This is gonna really help you.